Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Steve Gonzalez. Um, I've really been working uh, in um, with youth, adults, geriatrics uh, for many decades now, and I appreciate the opportunity to present. Uh, I've been a faculty member in behavior analytic and or psychological departments probably since uh, um, late 1990s, so I've been in academia for a while, and uh, actually I'm the founder of the South Texas Behavioral Institute where we work with um, the full life spectrum on all types of behavioral and developmental disorders, uh, as well as neurotypical children and adults uh, that are presenting uh, issues. So sexuality has been one of the topics that has definitely been of interest for a long time. So uh, we, we like to talk about it because it definitely shapes who we become and how we become who we become uh, as we grow older. So today's discussion really is about exploring that idea in understanding um, how that allows us to really understand who we are as individuals and about how to understand how we got there and what is considered to be some normal behavior, what is considered to be some not so normal behavior, and really when to start looking at and thinking about some concerns. So uh, as, as we go on this adventure here for for an hour, I will go through it quickly. Keep in mind that this is usually a couple of hours presentation, so we'll kind of go through some high level. Uh, always welcome to email me, and James will provide me any uh, questions that you have and have to answer them appropriately. So, if you think about sexuality and how sexuality plays a significant role in our life, um, think about reflectively how did you actually learn about it? And where did you learn it from? And who did you learn? It's always interesting because everyone's story is different. There is no textbook for sexuality. Uh, and sexuality is so much more than just the idea of the physicality that people think about. Uh, it has to do with emotions. It has to do with acceptance. It has to do with rejection. Uh, it has to do with uh, feeling uh, endorsed and, and part of a group as opposed to rejected from certain groups um, and so forth. So um, some of us learn sexuality through uh, experience of looking at magazines. Some of us had the birds and the bees talk. Um, some of us accidentally bumped into sexuality by self-discovering our own bodies. So everyone's story is a little bit different. And how do you determine what is appropriate versus what is inappropriate? Well, you know, I, it's funny because I remember as a kid, my grandmother telling me a story about a stork. And I asked her, I said, Grandma, where did I come from? You know, who, who, who brought me here? And she said, well, there was this beautiful stork. He was a great big bird. And the bird carried you in a little satchel. And when he saw your mom, he dropped it and she picked you up and that's where you came from. So as silly as it sounds for years, I was looking up at the sky as a kid and wondering, I don't want to get hit by birds dropping big, you know, satchels of things. Um, and, you know, that's when I started discovering the idea. So my story was very different than the traditional birds and the bees story. Um, and then from a euphemism standpoint, you ask yourself, well, what if birds and bees really have to do with sexuality and how did that become so that's the idea in in really today sexuality is so diversified it's so unique uh, it has so many different facets when we think about sexual preference uh, when you think about sexual orientation uh, when you think about culture and what culture means for sexuality um, you look at television today and you compare it to television from the 1950s, how different does it look? Perhaps maybe what you saw today in an evening show on regular TV may have been considered pornography back in the 50s. So um, as a culture, as a society, we also evolve in how we see sexuality and how we understand what it actually means. So why is it that what all individuals, for example, that have a disability or sexual thought is generally viewed as inappropriate? Or why is it that sometimes individuals that may have same gender preference um, sometimes are viewed as uh, being thoughts that are inappropriate? 
Well, that really talks to a lot about our culture, uh, our values, our religious preferences. Uh, and it really talks to how we are being raised, how we identify with certain preferences. And it's important to understand that every single person and every individual and family represents who they choose to be. And that's something that's really important to understand as we continue to develop as a society is that um, our individuals, our children, have a one-way door. And what I mean by that is the, the door actually has the deadbolt on their side and they hold the key. So it is important that as we interact with our children and our teens and our young adults, Faults, that we understand that they have the ability to lock us out. And once they lock us out, we can't get in because they're the only ones with the key. So keep that in mind. Um, keep that in mind when it comes to discussions. Keep that in mind when it comes to questions and how we approach the idea of, of sexuality and how we approach these discussions. And I know what you're saying right now. You're like, okay, great. I get all that. I understand things are different today. But how do I answer these hard questions? And that's, that's always the, the most difficult part of actually working and understanding sexuality. So, you know, the, the idea here is that some of the biggest issues that we face today with individuals with disabilities, uh, individuals without disabilities, is a lack of sexual education. And you know, the thought and the question usually is, well, why do you think that is? Where, you know, they have the formal classroom um, in, in schools. Uh, they have the, the discussion about, you know, procreation. They have the discussion about what it is to have protected sex. Um, why is it that, you know, there continues to be a lack of sexual uh, education out there? Well, if you really think about it, some of that has to do with the idea that people are uncomfortable talking about sex. As much as it is in today's mainstream media and is um, purposefully put out there uh, in magazines and commercials, even in, in your phone that you open up and you get marketing clips, um, sexuality and the, and the conceptual idea of how we promote ourselves uh, physically, sexually, emotionally, even cognitively, uh, is, is really, really profound. And the question then becomes, okay, if it's that mainstream and, and that popular, how do I have a discussion? And when do I have a discussion with my child about it if they're this exposed? So hopefully I'm hitting some of the questions you're thinking or, or reasons why. Well, our personal upbringing, society, religious, normative, and personal values don't support discussing sexuality. Things are transitioning, which is amazing. There's a sense of more openness around this, but there are still, you know, sections, and this is all uh, also in line with your particular personal culture and religious values, your normative values, your family traditions and how that happens. The other part of it is we don't know where to start or what to say. How do I tell or start talking to my three or five year old about sex and sexuality? It's really weird. Um, my three year old loves to run around the house after she takes a shower and says, hey daddy, I took a shower and she's not wearing clothes. Is that appropriate for her to do that walking into the kitchen? What do we have company? Uh, how do I approach that? Um, what if talking about sex makes them actually more curious? I don't want to make them more curious. I'm scared. Does that mean that they will want to be more interested in the idea of having sex? Well, keep in mind that sex is just not physical. There's so much more that comes with it, and we'll get into that here. So our child has ever expressed an interest in sexuality, so we're not concerned. You know, it's probably not happening. Well, keep this in mind. Um, even our biology, uh, whether you have somebody that is neurotypical or somebody that may have disabilities, um, you have to understand that their bodies are still sexually oriented in the sense of reproduction. 
um, emotionally their bodies are developing, cognitively their minds are developing. And from a social reciprocity standpoint, their bodies are also interacting um, in, in, in needing that attention, the affirmation. In some cases, we may hear things like, well, they can't cognitively understand the concept of sexuality and what is appropriate versus inappropriate. So what do I do then? And again, these are all things to really think about and to consider. So, for example, we have people with intellectual disabilities generally have the same range of thoughts, attitudes, feelings, desires, fantasies as people without. Um, neurotypical children go through the same thing. Somebody that may have a developmental disability may begin puberty at the same age as other children and experience the same physical and hormonal changes. In, in the school system, that doesn't necessarily separate them in the sense of saying, ah, okay, so you have... Uh, you're a neurotypical child, you may have the disability, therefore sexuality is going to be different physically. That may actually not be true because the physical aspects of their body, depending upon um, what is happening with their disability or not, uh, may actually be very similar to somebody that does or does not have a disability. So that's what we find uh, is that there's a lot of information out there that sometimes scares us and concerns us. So uh, despite these similarities, an individual with or without a disability will need more education and support to understand and manage these thoughts, feelings, desires, and physical changes. Well, why is that? Well, if you think about it, the time when we grew up, depending upon your age, and with every decade of years that you go through in life, it changes. But let's just go back two or three decades, uh, and think about how different times were then when it came to sexuality, when it came to thoughts, feelings, desires, when it came to exposure on television, exposure on radio. Let's look at the videos of music. Let's look at things such as what you see on TikTok, what you see on YouTube. Um, think about how different that is and the exposure that your children have. According to um, the US Sex Information and Educational Council, human sexuality encompasses the sexual knowledge, belief, attitudes, values, and behaviors of individuals. Yes, it does deal with anatomy and physiology and biochemistry, uh, but it's also important to identify that it has to do with roles with personality, with who you identify to be as an individual, your personal preference and choice. Uh, individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, relationships, um, ethical and spiritual, moral concerns, and group cultural variations. So these are things that are relevant, that are important, uh, that we actually uh, need to be connected to. So think about, for example, the first time you dated somebody, whether it was in elementary school and you called them your boyfriend or your girlfriend, uh, whether it was in middle school, high school, secondary school, whether it was a university, um, and they rejected you. They broke up with you. They said, I can't be with you anymore. I'm so sorry. You're not my girlfriend. Johnny is my girlfriend or Lizzie is now my, my girlfriend or boyfriend. And you were crushed. So the question that I have for you is you're reflecting on this and you're thinking about it is why is it that you're able to go back and reflect on it? Obviously it had some sort of an impact on you. And that's what we're talking about here when it comes to sexuality. It's way more than just the physical aspect. And that's so important to kind of keep in mind. Now I do see some of you guys writing some things on chat and I apologize I don't have the chat up just for the sake of time, but we will definitely get to your questions if you have some. So uh, we get into sexual development and, and multi-dimensional ideas here. So gender or socialization, physical maturation, body image, self-esteem, social relationships, future social aspirations. So it's so much more than just hormones and reproduction. Think about um, the old concept, if you go back into the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when you heard the term, oh, okay, the nurse is going to come and help me. Back then, 
the idea, the concept that a nurse could only be a female or was a female, again, was a stereotype. But it was also gender role identifying. So think about that as an example. Think about a construction worker. It was, again, identified as most likely a male. Today, you see females doing construction work. You see females that are firefighters, that are uh, law enforcement officers, that are jet fighter pilots. So again, we evolve and our relationships evolve. Our self-esteem associated with these things evolve. And that's what's so important. So open your mind a little bit to the idea that sexuality and understanding sexual development is so much more than just talking about uh, the, the euphemism of birds and the bees. It's really about emotions. It's about how relationships are established. It's about acceptance and rejection. It's about understanding personal preference and understanding how that will affect an individual and what are some safety nets to put into place to help with those things. So benefits, social interaction, skill development. We have to learn how to be social, improve feeling and attitudes toward towards, uh, values and self is greater independence, the reduced risk of abuse, pregnancy, and STDs. A really interesting question that I, I once pondered on and I asked a group many, many years ago uh, when giving a, a similar presentation was this. Would you like to be the individual presenting the idea of sexuality to your child, the idea of emotional uh, maturity or emotional intelligence, the idea of being sexually safe, knowing what the risks of abuse, pregnancy, and STDs are? Or would you like to have their friend tell them how to do that instead? Just a point of reference for you to think about. How involved do you want to be as far as what you've experienced, what you've been exposed to, and establish and develop protective capacities for your child, for your teen, for your adult? Or do you want to allow some stranger to do it for you? Again, these are the things, and this is some point of the fear I want to instill in you, in the necessity for you to be involved uh, in this conversation and do it over time, and we'll talk about what that looks like. Um, the language to report abuse, healthier choices in sexual behavior and relationships, and appropriate sexual behaviors, and being able to identify when there are some behaviors that may be deemed um, not necessarily appropriate and of concern. What does that mean? You know, if, if I'm seeing a child exploring their physical body and they're three to four years old, uh, is that considered normal? Absolutely. They're understanding the physical aspects. However, I, if I'm seeing a three or four year old that is sexually aggressive and using language that is much more sophisticated than their cognitive ability levels should be, then perhaps there's reason to be concerned now because of exposure that may have taken them to that level of understanding or that level of modeling and demonstrating uh, demonstration with others and or with um, dolls, for example. So uh, as we talk about risks of avoiding sexual education, we look at things like sexually transmitted disease, pregnancy and victimization. Um, again, Today, we have access to the internet. Uh, when you look at our phones today, these are some of the most dangerous, but yet most powerful tools out there. Think about how often you have uh, perhaps had your information stolen, maybe had a credit card that was used that um, was by someone you didn't get permission to use it. And you had to communicate with your bank and say, I'm concerned about my identity. If somebody's trying to steal it, they have my bank information. They've taken money from my account. Those are encrypted systems. This is just a button. And that button gives access to your child, to your adult, to your teen. Think about the inherent risk there. Think about what the possibility of that communicative process could look like. 
again, I don't want to scare you, but I want to bring you into 2021 and say, be aware, things are different than when we grew up. But it's also a really beautiful time when people are exploring who they are as individuals. When children have access to a lot more knowledge, which can mean we can provide them with information to make them more safe. So what are some reasons um, that in the, our, our children are at risk? Knack, a lack of uh, knowledge. Think about all the misinformation that's out there on the internet. I was watching uh, a video narrative the other day and I thought it was quite funny. It was, it was, it was talking about the, the brain and development and it said, however, I need to pause because you know and I know that if it's on the internet, it's true. Therefore, you have to believe it and take it as absolute truth. So that's, there's so much misinformation out there when it comes to what you find on the internet. And again, just as a reminder, they probably have access to this. And if just for a second, you think that oh, you, you control this, guess what? You don't control their friends. So their friends may have access to it and they probably borrow their friends' phones too. Mistrust placed in others due to dependence from others' assistance Overcompliance, uh, overprotection, and limited social contact, and lack of strategies to protect themselves. These are all things and elements that we have to ensure that our children are aware of and our children understand. Um, and remember, education about sexuality is something that's ongoing and it's tailored to the age of the individual throughout their life. Um, it's not the idea of I'm going to have this discussion with you about sexuality today, and we're gonna do it over lunch. And then as a mom or as a dad or as a parent or as a foster parent or a grandparent or a partner, I can say, check box, we're good, we're done, we had the sexuality talk, they should be good to go. If that's the case, ask yourself, why are you attending this session or listening to it as a recording? because you still have questions about sexuality. So it goes on throughout life. Even for us as adults, we still have questions and it's absolutely healthy to continue to explore sexuality because you are also exploring who you are as an individual. And that is absolutely uh, appropriate. So what is the right way, what is the wrong way? Well, that's kind of like asking how do you live your life? Is there a right way to live your life or is there a wrong way? Well, technically there is no right way to teach a child or adult about sexuality. It's really about what, what is reflective of your values, your norms, your traditions, your religious upbringings, your personal preferences. Um, it's a process that we will involve and have successes. Uh, we're going to accidentally make mistakes and kids today will, will check us on it. They do. My kiddo checks me all the time. Dad, you said this. I looked it up. I don't quite agree with it. Okay, well, well let's have a discussion because I know that if I tell her, well, sweetheart, I'm sorry, but you found it on the internet. The internet's wrong. Dad's right. As opposed to having a dialogue, she holds that key to that deadbolt on that door. And once she closes it and locks that deadbolt, I know I'll never be able to get back in again. At least it will be very difficult to. So I'd rather recommend to you to have a narrative, have a dialogue and talk about what it is that they're curious about as opposed to completely shutting it down. Remember, that's the one thing is once they lock that door, they lock that door. Don't get frustrated. It's so easy to become frustrated with this topic and it's so easy to become frustrated because there is so much disinformation. Um, we're gonna have to address this, these ideas, these concepts, this idea, idea about sexuality over and over and over again. As I go through the different stages of, of, of emotional development, metaphysical development, of neurological development, their sophistication on how they understand things continues to expand. And what we know today is research has showed that the, the brain actually continues to develop up to age 25. Isn't that amazing? We used to think it was much, much at a much younger age that it actually stopped developing and growing, but it's actually up to age 25, which is fantastic. 
So what does that mean? That means that we have neural pathways constantly um, exploring the brain and developing and growing like seeds. Uh, and those neural pathways allow us to take new experiences, become part of who we are, and then access them just like a computer does uh, whenever we need to access them. So the idea here is how do we teach sexuality? Well, we start by, you know, looking at age and developmentally appropriate books together. That's absolutely okay. There's so many phenomenal books. And I'm going to give you um, some information here on this PowerPoint that you can write down or uh, Mrs. James can provide to you guys later and, and some links on some appropriate things. And I have no connection with these books, authors or publishers are just really cool things that I've used in the clinical setting to, to work through these types of uh, questions with families and so forth. Pictures, demonstration with dolls when appropriate, showing where babies come from, you know, uh, as much as my grandmother meant well, and it was about the the big stork dropping the baby, you know, the, the fear of looking up at the sky for the big stork for a few years, not understanding that, you know, she meant well, it just wasn't quite true, um, you know, it was something to consider proper terms as much as possible, specifically those that have developmental disabilities. Um, they may have more difficulty understanding euphemisms. Um, I'll share a quick story with you. So there was a, a story shared with me by a police officer one time that was very frustrated. And he says, you know, I'm going to ask you something. Since you do a lot of presentation work in clinical work, he says, if you could share with families to please teach the kids to use appropriate names of body parts. And of course, I piqued my interest and I said, can you walk me through the example of why this, this prompt to me is so important to you? And he says, well, look, I got called to a case one time and I showed up and we were pretty sure that this guy was, was touching this young girl uh, inappropriately. I said, okay. He says, unfortunately, the parents taught the young, the young girl that her breasts were called bonbons. Okay, bonbons like the ice cream? And he's like, yeah, that's what she did, bonbon, because there was a set of two. I said, okay. So when we got there ourselves, the child protective uh, investigator, and we asked her, can you tell us what happened? And the child says, oh, he touched my bonbons, and went to the refrigerator, pulled out some ice cream, and showed us the bonbons. And this was very troublesome because they could never actually uh, determine whether the child actually touched the ice cream or physically touched her. Later down the line, he was actually uh, caught being inappropriate with the child and touching what was quote unquote called the bonbons. So that's what, what we mean by euphemisms is be transparent in the, in the name and it's okay to say, this is your vagina. These are your breasts. Uh, this is your nipple. This is your penis. Um, these are your. This is your scrotum. Uh, and use those terms and teaching them properly from the very beginning. And what it does is it establishes a, a baseline, a foundation, and it's a protective system that you build for your child or for your adult. So, what are some obstacles in learning? Well, some kids learn at a slower rate than others. Some don't necessarily understand what you're trying to say, maybe the sophistication is, isn't there. Uh, literary, literary skills, so when you find a book, you find something that's age appropriate. Um, abstract thinking is something that we develop and comprehension comes over time. And they may not have any experience with it, so related to their life experiences, but also give them examples of your life experience. Let's remember, you are the person that they look to. And the idea here, we know that trauma brains, children that have ex been experienced or exposed to trauma, um, will look at the people that are their most important, such as their caretakers. Uh, and if mom and dad can do it, I should be able to do it as well. Again, that's the conceptual ideology behind it. Give the positive messages. Remember, it's okay for someone to have uh, exploration. It's normal for a three or four year old to explore their body. Um, you know, when you're looking at seven and 12 year olds developmentally, you know, even uh, four, five, six, they, they may understand masturbation. They may understand the feelings associated with it. 
Um, they may start looking at others undressing. They may start exploring with their friends, their, each other's physical bodies. You may start hearing jokes about body parts. Sexuality is, is exactly that. It's an exploration of being human. So don't shut them down because remember, they hold that key. Have that discussion with them and say, hey, look, I know that you're touching a personal area of yours. Let me show you where it's safe to do it and where it's not safe as an example. Provide super clear rules regarding what behaviors are okay and which ones are not. Again, this is all general information that will be self-reflective to you and specific to your values, your cultures, your norms. Um, so keep that in mind. And it's sexuality. So don't be so serious. Uh, and I say that in the sense of emotions, of relationships, of the physicality associated with it. Um, think about how you learned and think about how you wish you would have learned and provide that kind of a mindset when you're working uh, with your child, teen or adult. When do we teach this? Throughout a person's life, beginning in early childhood. Um, look for some of the cues when a child expresses interest and or curiosity. Uh, check the internet settings as far as the history on your child's device. Um, now, kids today are pretty sophisticated, so they might erase that history. I know back in the day when I was growing up, we would look at the newspaper and the ad be missing uh, when it talked about what types of bras and underwears were available at the local uh, Macy's store, the local Kmart store. Uh, and those were things that you would look for. We're looking at before and during puberty, long bathroom breaks. We're looking at uh, shampoo very quickly being utilized privately in the bathroom. What context is that being utilized? Um, and, and you're looking for things such as if that's the case, I have to also think about it from a safety perspective. I don't want them to uh, develop a UTI because they're using um, shampoo as a form of um, uh, masturbation, you know, as a form of, of something to help them masturbate, whether it's male or female. Um, look at appropriate versus inappropriate expressions of sexuality. Again, this is going to fall back on you. Times today are so different and they're so progressed, which is really cool because now you're able to really have deep discussions about who people are internally and what's important to them and help them explore those ideas and find who it is the person that they want to be and they want to become. Um, body parts, uh, personal care and hygiene, that's all sexuality. Think about it. You ever were with somebody and you were going to kiss them and they had bad breath? How does that affect who they are sexually? It does. Simple, goofy example, just like that. But it does. Uh, the mechanics of sex, reproduction, contraceptive, STDs, uh, protective uh, behavior, social skills, relationships, values, all of these things. How to deal with somebody that says, I don't like you. You're ugly. Oh, God, some of you are reflecting this very second on an experience you may have had as a child or as an adult. That affects who you are. Uh, think about the, 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 um, what people wear today. Oh, my God, you're wearing that. You must be uh, a very promiscuous person. Uh, or, God, you're wearing that. Men shouldn't wear clothes like that. Why are you wearing that? Again, these are topics to explore, things to explore. So there's a, uh, there's a website called uh, sexualityandyou.ca. Again, I have no connection to this. Uh, it's just resources that I found out there. And these are some examples of cards that are out there that are really interesting and unique. And it talks about private body parts, um, when they should be covered, for example, swimming suits, uh, very basic information. As they grow older, you're able to get into more and more sophisticated cards. And these sophisticated cards look more like, let's, let's look at connection. So it's a game that, can you show me the picture of the young man's leg? Which one is the picture of the vagina? 
Can you show me the young lady's breast? And what you're doing is, again, you're establishing a baseline here to ensure your child understands their body parts, but also has protective capacities to protect them. Okay. Um, here's another example of, of private versus public. By the way, going back to this, um, Bexley and Zendel 2005 are examples of where you can go, and these are published articles here, that you can get some of this cards and information and use these. Um, here's some other examples of uh, places that are public or private. So it's very hard to tell somebody, listen, you can only masturbate in, your ba in a bathroom because it's private. Well, guess what? There are public bathrooms. Walmart, do you want the child knowing the difference, the distinctive difference between a Walmart bathroom and a home bathroom? Um, so there, again, the, there's different cards that will help you with that. Um, back to Lane Zendo 5 here uh, provides a really cool worksheet that shows you discussion points on house rules, rules regarding touch, dress, private areas, community schools, everyday activities. And it's significantly bigger than this, but this is just kind of a, a quick peek into it. Go out there, find this, pull it up, and you'll see, wow, this is a cool list. This is also a great guide on how to have discussions about this. Um, it, it's almost like a, a formatted guide. Um, so that's really cool there, uh, something for you to access there. Talk about relationship skills. Uh, help youth practice appropriate affection, including with whom and where. Um, is it appropriate to hug everybody? Who do you not hug? Who do you hug? Um, explaining what social norms are. So, you know, if, if you have somebody, for example, that has an intellectual uh, disability, should they be hugging uh, little girls that, or little boys or vice versa? Is it okay? Did you ask permission to hug them first or not? Role play this. Remember, whoever your wife, husband, partner is at home, that will determine how your, chi your child or your individual sees as appropriate or inappropriate role playing. And they will actually go out and try that. They will, they will test it. Um, teach the right to refuse. It's okay to say no. Your body is your body. Your emotions are your emotions. Your space is your space. And use social situations. Give them context. They have to understand within the context of what's happening, how it's, master, uh, how it's actually happening. For example, masturbation, the self-touch. Be careful here. Remember, if, if you find that your child is exploring their body, which they will, um, you know, provide them with guidance on safety, the natural and healthy way to explore it. Um, the private place. Children uh, will start the conceptual idea as their cognitive abilities continue to develop into things that are of personal preference. Uh, as adults, you may call this as a fetish. They may start developing that and find curi curiosity in certain things that you may not. And it's okay for them to do so and guide them. Teach them the healthy ways to explore. Um, think about, for example, he says, individuals who masturbate in public may have been told to only masturbate in private, but they have difficulty because they're not visually stimulated. So what does that mean? Well, that doesn't mean provide them, you know, with uh, pornography, but that does mean sit down and have, have a, a, a discussion, explore with them what it is in public that is causing them to want to do that in that place, and then see how you can substitute a safety place a security place where you feel within your family's values, norms, ethics, and so forth, a religious beliefs that this is okay to do it here and provide them as a guidance. Remember, you don't want to embarrass them because by doing so, you're going to actually have them lock that door on us and we don't want to do that. Birth control and, prevent, and prevention. For individuals that have disabilities, for example, it may be difficult to comprehend long-term consequences of pregnancy and STDs, as well as those that are, uh, don't have developmental delays. Um, look at things like barrier devices, uh, birth control pills. These are all things that I highly recommend you talk to your doctor about. Perhaps talk to your personal uh, religious uh, authority about your priest, your um, you know, whoever it is that you feel is important, of course, talk to each other as a family uh, and say, how do we 
uh, talk about this conversation? How do we have these conversations? You know, is, is there some sort of medication? Um, what do we do? Injectable con uh, contraceptives, decision making regarding sterilization. That was something that always comes up and that's why I included in here is these are things that you have to look at legally. Talk with your doctor, talk about risks associated with them. Um, you know, make sure that you're including that person as part of the decision making process. So, you know, these are discussion points that a lot of people are afraid to talk about. But remember, do you want to have these discussions with your child or your adult or your teen? Or do you want somebody else to have them that maybe don't represent who you are, who your family is, the values associated with you guys? So when, is, when does sex, uh, sexual behavior actually become problematic? Well, it can be more difficult to determine normal versus problematic behaviors in children and adolescents and sometimes adults, for example, that may have this, uh, developmental disabilities because of age and cognition and ability and maturity. But it's also important to understand that for all children, regardless of disabilities, they're going to explore their bodies. Uh, and there's a lot of really great um, uh, information out there that talks about, for example, developmentally, when you're looking at a child that is three years uh, and under, they're going to explore their bodies. They're going to look at their bodies. You know, when you start getting into maybe four to six years old, uh, they they may start masturbating. They may start peeking and trying to look at mom and dad's body. Uh, they may actually have sexual jokes. They may try to show their body parts to each other. Um, when you start getting into seven to 12, now you're looking at the development of relationships. You're looking at the interaction with the physical body. You're looking at um, you know, the kissing behaviors. You're looking at exploring other people's bodies now. So again, these are in the, there's a lot of information out there. We can provide you some as well to start exploring and understanding. Um, and the, the ability to consent to sexual behaviors makes that difficult as well. If you have somebody with disabilities, uh, most often than not, you know, we, they're in environments that are very uh, controlled, very protective, but also they're very controlled and they're very protective. So when that's, uh, when our person is independent, you know, we, we leave that at risk. When your child, whether developmentally delayed or not, uh, is independent of you, we leave them at risk. So the question again posed to you is, knowing some of this and the ideas here, do you want to leave it at risk or is that something that you want to actually sit down and be a coach, be a guide, be a mentor and say, hey, I'm here, my door's open, please don't lock your door on me because I always want to be here to help. I never want to actually ridicule you or condemn you for what it is that you're doing. That may be natural. Okay, so uh, sexual behavior, uh, asking questions about their bodies, reproduction, birth, arousal, marriage, and of course, exploring gender roles and behaviors, looking at their bodies and the bodies of others, touching their genitals, engaging in mutual touching with age friends or cousins of the same or opposite sex, acting on behaviors with dolls, pets, stuffed animals, sexual uh, jokes, potty, potty words with peers, um, You'll start seeing in late childhood, again, you know, the 7 to 12 year uh, romantic interest starting to develop. Dating relationships may start to develop. Go back and think, think about the first time you had a crush on somebody. Uh, first time you had a girlfriend, you, you had an interest. Um, you may see the, the sexual fantasies begin to develop in adolescence. Adult-like sexual activity may begin in adolescence. Um, and by the way, statistically across the United States, you know that over 50% of high school age youth are sexually active? Wow, that's scary, isn't it? Think about it, over 50%. For every six friends that your son or daughter brings over, half of them are somehow sexually active. They are 100% sexually active in the sense of emotionally engaged, involved in being and growing as a person. Sexual behaviors may become problematic when um, we're looking at things that are causing complaints or negatively affecting other people or self aggression. 
um, forcing themselves on people, forcing themselves to um, the barter. I'll give you this if you touch me. If you let me look at your vagina, I'll give you cookies. This, these are cognitively high level behaviors that generally we don't see at, at, the, as, at these ages. Those are when they start going up a little bit. The balance with other aspects of individuals' lives and interests. They continue in spite of consistent and a clear requests to stop. Um, that's a big red flag if you've redirected the behavior and said this is not appropriate. You know, let's talk about what is appropriate, and that behavior continues to manifest itself. Um, definitely seek help of a professional a developmental pediatrician, a developmental psychologist, talk to a therapist. Um, they're done in inappropriate places despite being taught otherwise. So you know that they know, but yet they're still doing it. That's when you sit down and explore, you know, what it is about that environment, uh, what it is that may be causing that. They're unable to stop themselves. Uh, they are accompanied by aggression, verbal expressions of anger, fear, anxiety, deep shame, intense guilt. These are the things that we're looking for. These are the things that we're concerned about. Um, Generally, when you see these behaviors, I highly recommend you get assistance immediately. Uh, sexual behaviors are called physical or emotional pain or discomfort uh, to themselves or to others. Uh, sexual behavior towards much younger children, forcing others physically into doing sexual acts or tricking or bribing others into sexual acts. These are definitely areas of concern. This is where we want to get professionals involved to guide us through a step-by-step -step way of understanding where this may actually be coming from. Problematic sexual behavior in individuals with developmental disabilities, for example, may be also related. And this also goes for neurotypical kids without developmental delays, poor boundaries and social skills. Remember, social reciprocity is something that we learn through observation, through experience. Um, what environment are you allowing them to be exposed to? What are you them to. Repetitive and perceptive behaviors, social and romantic relationships, and the lack there of opportunity to have those, uh, and difficulty understanding abstract concepts, public, private, social cues, euphemisms as an example. So what do we do? Um, acknowledge the behavior. Hey, look, you're touching your penis. Touch your penis probably feels good. Let's find a safe place for you to do that, and let's talk about what is appropriate versus inappropriate. Discuss the rules. It's okay uh, to touch your penis, but it's not okay to do it at school. Let's talk about when you can do it here at home. Uh, management techniques. Be careful with rewards and punishments. I tend to want to tell people most often than not, stay away from punishments. Punishments can get them to lock that door and never let you in. Um, but reward them for good behavior. Hey, son, I noticed you took your private time in, in your bedroom. I'm proud of you. That's really great. I'm so happy that you're learning and you're being safe and you're taking care of yourself. Again, just a different way to use a narrative to help them ensure that they are protecting themselves. Let's look at safety issues also. Where's the behavior occurring? Uh, do others maybe at the... Um, uh, the CDC need to be aware, hey, this is something that's happening. Can you keep an eye on it for us? Can you keep some data for us? Let us know the frequency that you're seeing him rub on the carpet. Uh, uh, is increased supervision needed of the child and or others in home safe? You know, how does all this play out? What are the safety issues, environmental issues that I need to be concerned with when it comes to this? And, and when the behaviors continue not to decrease or increase, uh, are abusive harmful? Get some help. Assess them from, again, your developmental ped, uh, from your therapist, your, your, your psychologist, your behavior analyst. Um, start talking to them, say, how do we get um, support for these behaviors? Because these are getting to be problematic. And thank you guys for your time. Again, I went through this quite quickly today. I wanted to ensure that you had uh, the high level information. If you have any specific questions, uh, I'm more than happy to stick back for a few minutes and answer any that I can. Uh, I would definitely like to thank the EFMP, uh, Mrs. James, for having me today. So I appreciate your time.
if we have anybody with um, any questions, if you um, want, if you feel more comfortable um, emailing and I can, or, or just um, emailing um, <clears throat> Dr. Steve um, directly, you sure can. I'm going to send out the slides to everybody. So you have the slides um, um, hid on the slides, put down what those um, like sexuality and you at um, .ca is, all, um, is already on the slide. Um, so there's anybody, and, and he has the references on the very end as well. And uh, I'll make sure that I email those slides out to everybody.